this is how ridiculous the rental market has become. Uh, this house is trash. Um, if I had time, I would just go pan the street. This is not a very desirable aspect of Sandy Springs, but they want $5,000 for this rental house that's close to Sandy Springs. Now, one of the reasons I think they're asking this much for this is um, because of where it's located. It's not too far from the King and Queen building, but this is not a really nice house. Not at all. Um, I may actually do a video talking about this because th this, this, <laughs> I mean, it is, Let's see if we can do, um, see, this is what's on this street. Those kind of houses. These are not what you would call super nice houses. Now, there are some nice houses off to the left, off the street. Like once you come down and you go on some of the, well, actually, that's not true. Um, the nicer houses are actually the parallel street over. But yeah, this is garbage. What's up guys? Today we're gonna talk about real estate. And one of the most pernicious myths out there is the reason that first time house, home, first time starter home prices are at an all time high is because of these corporate buyers coming in with these cash offers. They're just destroying the real estate market. They're just making it so hard for that first time home buyer to get there. And after doing some analysis of the numbers, it's not the corporate buyers that caused the problem. I did some research. There, in 2018, there were 20 million rental homes per the United States census. That was four years ago. So we could safely say there's 22 to 24 million rental homes in the United States right now. Now, here's the thing. The majority of these rental homes are owned by mom and pop rental investors, not corporate America. Corporate America owns maybe four to 5% of these homes. These are these huge corporations that own 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars, 50, 60,000 homes. They only represent literally a drop in the bucket, literally a drop in the bucket. So once again, let's go ahead and talk about why we have this problem that we have. Meet Kevin, Stephen Graham, um, Ryan Pineda. There are a number of YouTube real estate investors that have been putting out YouTube content for years. And what this has created is a frenzy for the mom and pop investor to get into real estate, Grant Cardone. So this is something this problem didn't start before the pan. This problem didn't start after the pandemic. This problem started years and years and years before the pandemic. And what's happening is, and this is why I call it the real estate problem. And the real estate problem is not a crash this summer. The real estate crash isn't happening this summer. It may start fourth quarter of this year, but it is not going to happen. Even if they raise interest rates three, four more times, you're still going to have people buying these properties this year. 
the real estate crash in 2023 is the year. 23, 2023 is the year for the recession. 2023 is the, re the year for the real estate crash. And it's not going to happen in January of 2023. One of the things that they, I did some research because I, I need to make a correction. I talked about that home, new home builders pulled 1.5 billion, not billion, million new housing construction permits. Actually, they pulled 1.7 million. And this is kind of like a record because after the 2008 recession, the number of new build homes dramatically strength. We are per, you know, a certain information portals, think tanks. We're literally 4 million homes short of the number of homes that people could buy and occupy. We're short. So this problem that we have today literally started 10 years ago. So once again, let's go ahead and look at the numbers and dive into all of the problems that are about to come. Okay, the goal here is to build out home economics before the end of the month, which we have six more days and we have a lot of stuff here. What you wanna do is enroll so you can be there for the webinar which is going to happen this Sunday at 4 p.m., Behaviors and Habits. So, like I said, you know, I've got six days to get this built out. There's more stuff that's coming. Everything that doesn't have draft by it is done, and the stuff that has draft by it, which some of this stuff will be filled in before Sunday, and I will start emailing you and letting you know about updates to the course. So what you want to do, you can enroll. The, the enrollment information is in the description. And the enrollment information is in the first comment. So what you want to do is go ahead and enroll today so you can be there Sunday for the webinar at 4 p.m. That's all I got for you now. I will see you Sunday. All right. So let's go ahead and take the frenzy caused by Ryan, Ryan Pineda, Graham Stephan, meet Kevin of all of these people getting in the real estate. And this is this is and those guys are just a small drop in the bucket. I like literally. I will see a ton of YouTube commercials about wholesaling, about getting into real estate, about coming to there. There's, there's an industry of creating, getting people to invest in real estate. There is a massive, massive industry. Like I said, from wholesaling to flipping to buy and hold and renting. So we have this massive, massive industry inducing people to get into real estate. And that's what caused a problem because there are so many people who have gotten into real estate. There have been so many people who are invested in real estate. Once again, corporate America only owns a small percentage of the rental homes in America, like two to four <coughs> percent. So it's not corporate America. Corporate America took advantage of a situation because the cash upon cash returns, these guys are getting 15 to 22% cash upon cash return from these rental houses because I did some more research and I was like, where are these companies getting all of this money? And it's big dog investors looking for a safe haven to park their, their, their money. Because th what these guys have done, and I did some math, like if you owned 3,000 houses, right? That would take almost a billion dollars to buy 3,000 houses. So some of these companies have literally have $10 billion tied up in residential real estate. But you know, just doing my numbers, those 3,000, that, that $1 billion was gonna generate between 90 million to 150 million, depending upon what market it's in, because most of these rental houses that corporate America are buying are in the Sun Belt. They're not buying these houses in New York. They're not buying these houses in Montana. There are still residential uh, real estate markets that are still quite affordable 
And guess where they are? Where people don't want to live. So for corporate America, this is a big win where you can get a 15 to 22 percent cash upon cash return, which is higher than the S&P 500, which is higher than the Wall Street. So once again, once you start to dive into the numbers, men lie, women lie. But once you start to dive into the numbers and get a greater understanding of what's going on, it makes perfect sense for them to go out to these institutional investors and get billions and billions of dollars to buy real estate and get a 15 to 20 percent cash upon cash return makes a lot of sense so they just took advantage of what's happening because here's something that is um quite interesting home ownership is increasingly getting out of the reach of the average person. What I feel is going to happen in the future is we're going to become a nation of renters because once again, even with the coming crash, you know, which will present a buying opportunity, it will present a buying opportunity for people who have cash. As I do my course home economics and someone left a comment and th this comment is very prescient to what I'm about to talk about. This comment was like, I went into AT&T to buy a phone and I didn't want to buy the phone on the payment plan. I want to pay cash for it. I have several iPhones and I've been doing this for years. I have never ever bought a phone from Verizon. I've always go to Apple and pay cash for my iPhone. And one of the things that is really rare, that is interesting is I can sell these phones for a discount in the secondary market. Like I can go out and buy a new iPhone today and then put it on the secondary market. And if I put it on the market for maybe 1200 bucks and let's say it costs 1500, that puppy will sell instantly, especially if it's brand new and it's sealed. But going back to the well-constructed comment, uh, he was talking about these, the attendant, the person who was helping him looked at him like he had three heads because so many people finance phones. Okay. I want you to talk about it. a phone. Let's say you're going to a Samsung, a, a Samsung, a cheap Samsung new is like two or 300 bucks and people are still financing these phones. They're still financing these phones. So we, when you take the gig economy, when you take McDonald's, when you take daily pay, people are not in a situation where they have good money management habits, nor can they have the ability to save the required down payment. Because right now, this class of home buyers is a much better, much financially astute, financially stable class of home buyers right now in 2022 than the home buyers of 2006, 2007, 2008. A lot of those home buyers were bogues. If like you were breathing, you could get a mortgage back then. You, you stated income, no problem. Bad credit, no problem. So one of the things that we have is a very good population of people who can buy houses right now is it's really really good so one of the things that is happening is even with the coming correction or crash that's going to happen in 2023 investing in real estate is still going to be a safer haven than most other investments so what we're going to see is We'll have a crash and the price of real estate will go down and then it, it'll probably shoot right back up. I don't expect real estate prices after this coming crash to be um, depressed for many years. Like after the last uh, real estate crash, I don't expect that. I expect we might have a year, maybe two of really good buying opportunities. And because there are going to be so many people who are going to get into buying real estate, getting their house, 
the price is going to just shoot right back up. It's not going to stay down for long. It's not going to be a durable long-term crash. It's going to like, it's, it might be the V-shaped recovery. It may just boom and do that. So once again, for those of you who are sitting on the sidelines with your cash and just waiting, you're not going to have too long to take because there's going to, because once again, once these 1.7 million new houses, and it takes a while to build all these houses, they just pull the permits. So these houses are going to start coming on the market February, March, April of next year. So this is when all of this stuff is going to start hitting. It's not going to happen this year. And uh, I have seen many YouTube videos that said, don't buy a house this year. Now, I, I think that um, advice really depends on where you live. If you live in the Sun Belt, the advice is spot on. If you live in Wichita, Kansas, you can go ahead and buy a house because these houses have not seen dramatic price appreciation in Wichita, Kansas, in Kokomo, Indiana, in certain parts of Michigan. They have not seen this crazy, but Miami, Florida, Florida has seen home prices rise 30, 30 to 35 percent in one year. So, no, if you're in Florida, you might want to not. I'm, I'm about to say it, you might want to move. You might you might want to move or once again, we're about to make a little detour. Um, one of the P, one of the big issues is that people don't uh, present or prepare themselves for the things they want in life. This is a situation that so many Americans are living. A lot of Americans are, their money is managing them versus them managing their money. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that your pocket, you go to a car lot, you cannot, let's say you go to a car lot, let's say you go to a Lexus lot, and the most, the, the Lexus that you can afford because your pockets have dictated how you're going to live is the cheapest Lexus they have. But you kind of want the middle of the range Lexus, which you cannot afford because you're allowing your money to dictate where you live. And I'm going somewhere with this. So stick with me. So the average first time home price, depending upon what markets you live in, is about three. 50 ish to 420 ish. And that is the average price of a brand of a starter home of a starter home. Like the real estate market that I would participate into, I can still find deals because, you know, I, I look because um, I'm about 90% sure that I'm going to resign my lease and stay here for two years. And then that third year, I'm probably going to buy a house. And uh, my, the market I'm looking in is past a million. Uh, there's deals here in Atlanta. There's deals. There's deals. I have seen many people in that price point lower the price of their house. So once again, uh, this is I'm, I'm going somewhere. So if you prepare yourself to buy a five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar house, you can get a house. Now, once again, because the prices of these starter homes has dramatically appreciated all real estate prices have appreciated i saw i remember looking at zillow years ago and seeing that they expected a price appreciation of homes and zip code 30327 was about four to six percent now it's 15 to 20 percent so the starter homes has pushed up the price of all real estate but if you prepare yourself to participate in the real estate market, about the $600,000, $750,000 dollars mark, you can get a deal and these houses sit on the market longer. Houses in the $330,000, $350,000 to $420,000, I mean, first day they go on the market, they've got offers, multiple offers. But the houses six, seven hundred thousand, they'll be on the market for three or four. They'll be on the markets the average time a house would be on the market for real estate. So once again, you know, if you are 
wanting to participate in the real estate market at the bottom of the market and you haven't prepared yourself to get to the intermediate market, you will be in for a dog fight. You will be in for um, pain. You, 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 you'll be struggling. You will get a crappy house. I, I'm going to say this because I, I, I did some research and a lot of people who have bought houses the last two years, like 68% were dissatisfied with the house because they bought too quickly. They put in an offer. Uh, some people didn't even get inspections and they were very dissatisfied with their, the, you know, the, the house that they got because they were so desperate to get a house. So go ahead, let's sit back a minute and think, how can you prepare? Like you and your wife, you're sitting down, you're having this conversation and she makes 30, you make 30, 60,000. Your parents left you some money. So you have $80,000 to put down on the house. Now I would have a different piece of advice for you. If you're a first time home buyer, I would take 10,000 of that 80,000 and start a small business and dramatically increase your income. And I would wait 12 months because what's, what's going to happen? Because you're not going to be able to count that business income until after two years. However, what you can do is start this small business. Once again, you make 30, your wife makes 30. And let's say you get this small business up to 20, the 20, let's say 50. You, you took $10,000 and you created a business that made 50,000 and while you're waiting. So now instead of having that 80,000, and let's take that 10,000 that you, you took and go ahead and at 40, now you have 110,000 to put down. So on a $400,000 house that leaves you a mortgage of around 300,000 or 290. So because you have a bigger down payment, this enables you to move up in the market where and as you move up into the market, you move into the intermediate, the intermediate part of the market. There's less fights, hassles, offer deals, and battles to buy a piece of property. There's just way less. So you essentially, you don't want to stay at the bottom of the barrel. You don't want to stay at the bottom. You want to move up to where you can actually participate in the intermediate market because if you don't believe me, do some research, go to Zillow and see how long houses, 500, 600, 700,000 are sitting on the market. Now, once again, this advice may be terrible if you're in a hot market, really hot markets, all property is pretty much moving off the market pretty quickly. But this is just a bit of advice to help you out because the real estate problem started, like I said, years ago. It didn't start like with the pandemic or after the pandemic. This started with the 2008, 9, 10, 11 recession where they stopped building as much new construction. And then with the Meet Kevins, the Stephen Grahams, the Ryan Pinedas, all of these real estate conferences with the house flippers, with everyone talking about getting in real estate, everyone got into real estate. And what do we know what happens when everybody runs through the same door? The room gets crowded. The real estate room is crowded right now. And from an investment standpoint, like these corporations that have cash, they will be able to weather the storm because all they got to do is like, they bought this house because I don't really know what their plan is for these big corporations that are buying um, real estate. I don't know what their plan is. I don't know if they plan to hold on because I know at some point they have an exit plan or maybe they don't. Maybe they plan on owning these houses forever because if you can get a 15 to 22 percent cash upon cash return, that's a significant return. That's a significant, because if you're getting 20%, 
in five years, you've got your original investment back, which is really, really quick, which is really, really quick when you talk about investing. So a 20% high 20% return five years, you've got your money back. And at this point it is a cash cow. And here's another little detour. Years and years ago, I used to be in the storage auction business and I learned some stuff that typically these storage facilities would pay for themselves, meaning the money that was invested in them within three to four years, they would pay for themselves very quickly. And at that point they would just start throwing off cash, throwing off cash. So what these institutional investors, which are represent very small part of the real estate market have created such large chunks and piles of cash that they can throw in the market and they can get an aggregate of so many properties that they can get these high cash upon cash returns. And like I said, I am not privy to what they're going to do for the future, but I can say from a number standpoint, what they're doing is really smart. And this is one of the reasons that I feel that a lot of these corporations were paying whatever to get these properties because the cash upon cash return was so high. It was like, at some point we'll make it up. You know, we may lose a little on the front end, but we'll make it up on the back end. So that's one of the reasons that they were like, Hey, we'll pay more. Not a problem because you know, they knew that they can get it back. Cause once again, I want you to think someone that is smart enough to raise 10 billion dollars is not stupid. First of all, to pitch, you got to have a really good pitch. You got to have a really good numbers and your pitch decks got to be immaculate. So these are not stupid, dumb people who are just jumping in for the short term. These are very financially astute people who, what I think, because once again, I'm not sure what they're going to do, but I feel that they're going to be in for the long term because long term, America is moving toward a rental nation because many Americans are not participating or preparing themselves to participate in the market. You may not be able to buy a house, but you can rent a house. And th this is a really um, s issue. This is a big, big issue. You have a lot of people who can afford the monthly payment for a first time first time buyer starter home. You have tons of people who can afford the payment. The real issue is they cannot afford to qualify for a mortgage because maybe they've got no down payment. Maybe they've got some things to their credit. So they have the money to buy the house, but they don't have the financial discipline or the financial profile to qualify to get a mortgage from a bank. And honestly, uh, I really would never go to a bank for a mortgage. I would never go to a bank for a mortgage. I would always go to a mortgage broker or something like that because you're just going to, cause see the banks, they're going to get, they're going to get theirs. They're not even worried. They could turn you down because they don't like the color of your shampoo, but a mortgage broker, they're going to work harder because they don't get paid until the deal closes. Whereas the bank's just going to, the banks have stack, banks have racks upon racks. They ain't even worried about you. But a mortgage broker is going to work harder. They're going to be more astute and they're going to get you the best deal they can because they have to, to close the deal. So I wouldn't go to a Chase or Wells Fargo to get a mortgage. I, I, I really wouldn't. I would go to a mortgage broker because the mortgage broker, they're going to get that mortgage and they're going to have that mortgage literally for a hot second because they're going to sell the mortgage on the secondary market because they don't have the deep pockets that the banks do. But one of the things that you guys have got to understand this mortgage, well, not mortgage, the real estate problem was started because information years and years ago. And I'm talking about when they used to call it your beacon score, not your FICO score it used to be called your beacon. There was something that car dealers and mortgage people had. It was called information asymmetry. 
they knew things that you did not know. As information asymmetry disappears, the room becomes crowded and the room is almost full. And when the room f gets filled up, boom, we're going to have a correction. And you see this in not just real estate, Toro. Um, there's a guy, Automotive Life. I don't think the guy gets the views he should get because once again, he tells you the truth. And he's done several videos where a lot of people were leaving Toro. A lot of people were leaving Toro. Yet you had all these other Toro people talking about everyone's joining Toro. And his name is Lucky. He was one of the few people who was telling you the truth about the car rental business. And he has said in many videos, do not finance these cars in your personal name, which is some, what someone else has said. And once again, I don't think the dude gets the views that he should get because he's telling you the truth. And this is one of the reasons that we have the real estate problem. People don't want to hear the truth. People don't want to hear the painful truth that you need to be well positioned and well qualified to get a mortgage. This is why, hey, you can buy a house with no credit, no cash and flip it and make money a.k.a. wholesaling. This is why wholesaling is so big. And like I said, I know someone who's a wholesaler. And uh, he's, he just upped his wholesaling budget from 15000 a month to 25000 a month because he's got a plan. One of the things that he has done, he has accumulated about 30 properties. And what he is doing He's getting mortgages on all 30 properties. You want to know why? Because we had a conversation the other day and he feels the same thing. He feels that a buying opportunity is coming next year. And what he's going to do is have a chunk of cash because he's going to get mortgages on all 30. At the moment, all, none of his properties have mortgages. And at some point he's going to start getting loans on these properties and he's going to get a bunch of cash because he's not selling his properties he rents them out but he you know he's going to get a bunch of cash and he's just going to leave it in the bank and he's going to be waiting he's going to be waiting he says i should be finished with getting mortgages on all of these properties no later than october and he's good because he, he just smells a buying opportunity so he's going to be able to leverage the equity in these 30 properties and buy when the model when the market corrects like I don't think there's going to be percentage wise, we may see a 15 to 25% correction. That's not going to last that long. Let's, let's be really, really clear about that. It's not going to last that long. Why? Because once this correction happens, we have so many people who are well positioned, well qualified, they have good credit, they have a down payment. They're going to pounce on these properties. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the correction only lasted a year. I wouldn't be surprised. It's going to be a very brief correction. It's not going to last like 2008. It lasted 2008, 2009, 2010, 2012, 13, 14. We started coming out of that in about seven years. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be boom. It's going to drop. And then a whole bunch of people who are sitting on the sidelines with cash, they're going to push the market back up. Like I said, I would be surprised if this correction lasts two years. I would be shocked if it lasts two years because there's, there's, there's just too much money. There's too much money out there from an institutional standpoint because what I feel during this correction is the institutional buyers are going to go nuts because these are people who have billions of dollars and they're just going to like sh pounce. They're going to pounce on it like that cheetah or that lion pounced on that antelope. They're just like, ah, and they go bite in the neck and it's like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't feel that the correction is going to last that long, but we will be in a recession. And I do feel that the recession is going to last a while. So we're going to have inflation. We're going to have a brief correction with real estate. Once again, I'll, I'll be shocked because I feel that it's going to last 
the correction is going to last nine months to about 15 months. Like I said, if it lasts two years, I would be shocked because you have to look at the marketplace condition. There are too many people who are astute, who are smart, who are savvy because there's a, I'm not the only one now talking about a recession. There's a lot of people like we got a recession, we got a recession. And a lot of people like, Ooh, and once again, recessions are like half price sales for rich people. That's what a recession is. You know, if you're poor, you get crushed by the recession. You get smacked by the recession. But if you got money, guess what you do in the recession? You make more money. So once again, this recession and this um, correction or crash of real estate is not going to last that long. And I feel what's going to happen because right now, if you're someone who wants to get in real estate, you need to prep yourself because it will be a buying opportunity. And if enough people who are on the sidelines jump in the market at the same time, the correction will be maybe six months because I know that I talk about that 80% of Americans make $35,000 a year or less. And I know that I have talked about the income problem in America, but here's the thing. There are people out there with stupid money, stupid money. I'm talking stupid money. I'm talking, Oh, I'm going to buy me a condo for 150 million in New York. I'm going to buy me a nice castle in London for 200 million and I'm going to buy me an island in the Caribbean. You got people with that kind of money who are buying all that type of stuff in one year. Stupid money and stupid money. I say it's stupid money. Stupid money is actually quite smart and they're just going to pile this money into these investments. So yeah, a lot of the average Americans are not in the position to take advantage of this financial wind, windfall that's about to come. But the real estate problem that we have did not start after the pandemic. It started many, many years before. And what I feel just, you know, as we kind of get into it, what I feel is going to happen as we move into the um, phase is that the real estate problem is going to be worse in the future because once this buying opportunity, I mean, I, I actually have talked to people. There's so many people who are waiting, who are waiting. They're just sitting on their cash. They're just like, man, Glendon, I'm waiting. I'm waiting right now. It's too hot. It's too hot in the market. But when that market cools down, I'm going to jump in. I've, I've talked to a lot of people. So a lot of people, are just literally chomping at the bit. They can't wait till the market crashes. They can't wait. So it, it really depends upon who you are, where you are and what you're doing. It really depends upon that. So one of the things that you have to understand and appreciate is long-term planning because the folks who have a long-term plan, these are the people who are going to win because they're not being rash. They're not just jumping in the market. They're like doing their analysis. They're sitting on their cash. They're making their credit. Also, let's talk about credit. I don't feel that we're going to have a credit crunch in the next recession because you've got so many people that are well positioned. They have money. They have good credit scores. Never been late on anything. I don't think there's going to be a credit crash like there was in um, 2008. Like I, I know people who literally were told that their lines of credit got closed, their credit cards got crammed down for the well positioned, for the financially astute, for people with money in the bank, there will be no credit crash. Now for people who are like barely there, who kind of borderline, there will be a credit crash. But for the financially astute people with revenue, cash flow and money, there will not be a credit cash credit crunch. These people will be able to get all the money that they want, all the money they want. Because one of the things I have learned, so, you know, because for many years I didn't really pay attention to credit. I had good credit, 
but I really use cash first and I didn't use credit. And in about two years, I'm looking at to be sitting on about a million in business credit. And uh, I'm going to start running some experiments on the corporate game because honestly, I've never started a business on credit. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that feels like. I don't know. I don't know what that tastes like. So I may do this as an experiment and um, just go ahead and let you guys know because I can take the hit. I can go ahead and take some credit and throw it into something. And if it doesn't work out, I will be fine. So I think that's one of the things that I'm getting ready to do over at the corporate game because uh, I have disposable credit on the, on the personal side. I will, once again, I'm not using my personal credit. I will use my personal credit to get more business credit. That's all that. Cause right now I'm in the garden cause I got a whole bunch of personal credit cards and uh, I got like 10 inquiries in one month across multiple credit bureaus. So I'm just going to chill for about a year and maybe a year and a half and then do it again and then see what I can get from the business side. But once again, man, the real estate problem is deep. And the, the big problem for the average person is they don't have any money. That's the big problem. And that's a problem that if you were to sit down with your wife or to sit down by yourself and figure out some type of business that you can start, you can solve that problem. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments section with your well-constructed comments. And I will see you guys in the next one.